Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar. We'll get started in just a moment. All right, thank you for joining us. My name is Jesse Jones and I am the volunteer coordinator for the Coast Watch program of Oregon Shores. And I'm here tonight with Kent Doty from Lincoln City and our guest, Sarah Hamilton. I'm going to say a few words of uh, introduction and then um, we'll get started. This is being recorded. You can opt out. Um, there should be something that came up on your screens. I do see a, que a question there. Okay. So once again, my name is Jesse, and um, I'm the volunteer coordinator for Coast Watch. Tonight, uh, we are here in our third installment uh, with uh, our partners, Lincoln City Audubon, Beyond the Beach, and this is part three of three, our mysterious underwater, undersea kelp forests. Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition was founded in 1971 to protect the public interest in Oregon's beaches created by the Beachville. Among our key activities are advocating for protecting our beaches and headlands, and we deal with hundreds of land use issues. My program is Coast Watch, and we are a mile by mile beach adoption program. We ask our volunteers to walk their mile and create observations and submit those into our website. Um, but I see us as kind of a gateway for citizen science. Um, my favorite part of the job is connecting our volunteers with researchers up and down the Oregon coast to do some deeper um, re, uh, data collection on their miles, everything from marine debris to sea stars um, and more, including uh, uh, grasses. We have uh, some wonderful things coming up last year and this and this uh, and this next year as well. Okay. All right, Kent, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Kent Doty. And just a little background on Audubon Society of Lincoln City uh, has been serving Tillamook and Lincoln County since 2006. Our goals are education, community science, and conservation action. We also have birding outings and other events like this webinar. Um, our conservation focus areas include forest practices, rocky habitats, marine reserves, water quality, threats to fish and uh, to birds and wildlife, all viewed through the lens of climate change. Learn more about us at lincolncityaudubon.org. I will mention also that Oregon Coast Community College is also a co-host for tonight's program. They have been serving Lincoln County for 35 years with healthcare, aquarium science, business, teaching degrees, as well as certificates in childhood education, welding, and much more. Check them out for community education programs at Oregon Coast EDU. And uh, we chose uh, this part of the, this topic for our uh, Beyond the Beach webinar series because it's closely tied to our campaign to protect rocky habitats, uh, including nearshore kelp forests at Cape Lookout and Cape Fowlweather. Both Lincoln City Audubon and Oregon Shores do have proposals submitted to designate iconic sites along the coast as marine conservation areas. These designations would provide site-specific management uh, to deal with issues like kelp uh, uh, restoration and basically protect uh, habitat and ensure enjoyment into the future. Um, so I'm really excited about tonight's program and uh, looking forward to it. Thanks for that, Kent. All right, and I'm going to introduce our evening speaker who will be talking to us about all things bull kelp on our wonderful coast. 
Sarah is a marine ecologist who does use inspired basic research into the ecological questions that have directed implications for management and conservation. Uh, Sarah has a degree in biology and she studied women's, women's studies at, is it Bowdoin College? It's Bowdoin. Nobody oh, Bowdoin. else had a name knows how to pronounce it. Thank you. <laughs> um, she received her PhD in integrative biology um, at OSU and she is now um, doing her postdoc research at the University of California at Davis. She may be filling in a, a couple of things that I may have left out. Welcome, Sarah. We're super happy to have you be a part of our program tonight. Take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jesse and Kent Welcome. and the Audubon Bond Society and Oregon Coast Community College and Oregon Shores. Thank you all so much for having me here to, tonight. I'm excited to get to talk to this big group. Um, so thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Sarah Hamilton and I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California at Davis. Um, but more importantly for us here though, I got my PhD at Oregon State University studying kelp forests. My thesis focused on a variety of different tools and approaches to better understand how kelp forests in the Pacific Northwest are responding to global change. So today I'll kind of bring be bringing together a bunch of different threads um, that I studied and learned about during my PhD to give y'all some insight into the nature and the state of our kelp forests here in Oregon. Um, but before I start, I'd like to stop for a moment to acknowledge that I'm giving this talk today from Corvallis, Oregon, which are, um, is on the traditional homeland of the Chimpinifa band of the Kalapuya peoples who were, for, were forcibly removed from the land in the mid 1800s. Today, their living descendants include members of the Confederated Tribes of both the Grand Ronde community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Selects Indians. So with that acknowledgement, let's go ahead and dive on in. So let's briefly define what is a kelp anyway. So kelps are large brown marine seaweeds. They photosynthesize the way that plants do, leaving cool, shallow water and line about a quarter of the world's coastlines. So really widely distributed. And as you can see in these pictures, they can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And so why exactly do we care about these large brown seaweeds? Why would someone like me study them for four or five years? Well, there are a bunch of different reasons. First off, Health forests are ecosystem engineers, which just means that they create habitat just by being there. And so they create habitat for all sorts of critters, like fish, abalone, mice, sea otters, and many, many more. Health itself is also eaten by various critters. Uh, in this picture, you can see some pegula snails that are munching down on a uh, kelp buffet urchins, abalone, some kinds of fish, amphipods, and many other kinds of critters directly consume its rich tissues, including us humans. Many humans eat kelp as well. Even outside of the kelp forest itself, um, kelp can provide nutrients and substance. So when kelp is dislodged from the seafloor by big waves, it's ripped out and is kind of cast adrift. This happens a lot. The nutrient-rich kelp tissues can drift away and accumulate on the beach, as you see here in this picture, or in the deep sea, where they then get kind of broken down and provide nutrients and food for critters in those ecosystems hundreds of miles away from the forest itself, which I think is amazing. Kelp forests are also key to a number of commercially important fisheries. For example, kelp can be a key nursery habitat for rockfish and salmon, which are incredibly important to coastal communities here. And they also provide habitat and food for other commercially prized species like abalone and perchins. Kelp is frequently used as sites of recreation and tourism, anything from snorkeling to kayaking to spearfishing. This is actually a picture of my partner uh, snorkeling in a kelp forest with me last summer. Um, so they hold a lot of cultural values as spaces of recreation and tourism. And then finally, I just think that kelp can actually help pull carbon out of the atmosphere um, in a process known as carbon sequestration. So as I mentioned, kelp are really prolific 
full of synthesizers. And it's likely that all that carbon that they suck down out of the air during photosynthesis, some of that carbon ends up getting buried in the deep sea and being stored away from the atmosphere, similar to how the Amazon rainforest sequesters carbon in the trees and the soil. And so when you add up all the different benefits that we're receiving from kelp forests, a recent study was done by the firm Earth Economics and found that kelp forests along the California coastline are worth about $260 million a year to the California economy. So why do I care about kelp? Why did I spend so many years uh, studying it? Uh, well, I care about it because of all the benefits that it provides to coastal ecosystems and coastal communities. So that's why I think it's important. So let's zoom out from Oregon for a brief minute and kind of talk about the global context for kelps. Uh, and I'm going to start off by kind of talking a little bit about what is it that kelps need? So kelps, some of the fundamental things they need to flourish are one, light. They photosynthesize, so they need clear water that the light can penetrate so they can, um, they can photosynthesize. They need cool water because kelps are fundamentally uh, temperate and polar species, not tropical. They need clean water that has the right balance of nutrients, not too many, not too few. They need a situation where there aren't too many grazers. So things like those tegula snails or urchins or other things that graze kelp. If there are too many of those around, they overgraze the kelp. And kind of along that vein, they just in general need to be part of a balanced food web and have balanced species interactions with the critters around them. So unfortunately, kelp are facing a lot of, worldwide, kelps are facing a lot of threats that are caused by industrialized human societies. These threats include ocean warming, pollution, invasive species, and urchin overgrazing, all of which make it harder for kelp forests to persist. And with these threats, we're seeing some really major declines in kelp forest cover all over the world. So on this map to the right, I, these yellow stars are just some of the places where we begin to see major collapses of kelp forest ecosystems. So this goes from Australia to the Gulf of Maine to Spain, just to name a few. Furthermore, unfortunately, we have an example of kelp forest collapse happening uncomfortably close to home. Uh, so in 2015, the bull kelp forest in Northern California collapsed and lost about 90% of their former area. We think this class was caused by a combination of factors, particularly warming temperatures, marine heat waves, loss of the sunflower sea star, and booming urchin populations. And thus far, those forests really, they've started coming back a little bit, um, but they don't seem to be recovering so far in any real meaningful way. And this has led to the closures of the commercial red urchin fishery and the recreational abalone fisheries in Northern California. So this has had economic impacts as well as social and cultural ones. And so this kind of disturbing fact about Northern California leads to the obvious question, which is, oh shoot, what's happening to our kelp forests here in Oregon? So let's zoom back in and talk a little bit about the Oregon context. So first off, let's talk species. There are lots of different species of kelp here in Oregon. And these can be broadly categorized into canopy forming and sub canopy kelps. So canopy forming kelps are like the trees of the kelp forest. They grow really tall, they reach the surface of the water, and they form a canopy above, every, above the forest itself. Sub canopy kelps, which you can see more of over here on the right, they're more like the shrubs of the forest. They're smaller, they don't reach the, and they don't reach the surface of the water. So we have a lot of different species of subcanopy kelps here in Oregon. You can see some of them over there on the right. But we only have one major canopy forming kelp, which is the bull kelp over here on the left. Its scientific name is Neurocystis leucana. And so this is the kelp that I'll really be focusing on for the rest of the presentation. Um, but keep in mind that these subcanopy kelps are really important components of the ecosystem as well. I just don't have uh, time to talk about them right now. So a little bit more about the Oregon context. Um, historically in Oregon, there really hasn't been much study or monitoring of our kelp forests for a couple of reasons. I think one of the most important reasons is how it's really hard to scuba dive in Oregon. There are a lot of things that make it tough to dive here. And so that's traditionally the way that kelp forest research has been done is on scuba. Um, 
Additionally, most of our big, beautiful bull kelp forests are found primarily in the southern half of the state. You can see over here on the right that the biggest forests you'll find in Oregon are around Cape Arago, Port Orford, Gold Beach, and then scattered along the south coast down towards California. You can definitely find a bull kelp in central and northern Oregon, but probably about 90% of the population is actually in the southern third of the state. And since there are just a lot, there, there aren't that many people living on the southern Oregon coastline, and so there historically have been fewer people using kelp forests, advocating for them, studying them. So between some of these factors, we really don't have a lot of data on our bull kelp forests, as in what they used to look like, what they look like now, what factors drive their state. Uh, the best data that we have are a series of aerial surveys that the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife conducted, mostly in the 1990s, which are a good starting point, but Still, they were so sparse um, that it's hard to get a really good idea of how these forests are changing over time. And so that is where I come in. So when I first came to Oregon for my PhD, I realized no one really had a good grasp on how our forests were changing over time. And I had heard of these researchers down in California who were using satellites to study. And you may be thinking like I was thinking satellites, well, what the heck are you talking about? What do satellites have to do with kelp forests? Well, these researchers in California started using imagery from NASA's Landsat satellites. And you can see the Landsat satellite up here in the upper left. Now, these Landsat satellites have been circling the planet, taking pictures of the surface of the Earth continuously since the 1980s. And those researchers in California realized that kelp forests were so big you can actually see them from these satellite pictures. So here in the middle, um, above these red and blue images are, are false color images, um, and they show the coastline of Southern California. And then when you take away the land, you take away some of the sea, you can actually, if you know what you're looking for, you can identify these big patches of kelp right off the coastline. And this is what these researchers in Southern California had started doing. And so I started investigating whether that could be done here in Oregon, because that would be an amazing new source of, of information for us. Um, now, we weren't sure if this was going to work here in Oregon, because the studies that I had seen done already were actually done um, on giant kelp rather than the species that we have here in Oregon, which is bull kelp. Over here on the right, you see these two drone pictures. And you can see from these drone pictures of you know, these drone looking down on a kelp forest, the giant kelp has a lot more of its leaves or a lot more of its tissues held right up on the surface of the water than bull kelp does. Um, you can see that the giant kelp is kind of splayed across the surface, whereas with bull kelp, you kind of see more like pinpricks of, of tissue up there at the surface. And so bull kelp has a lot less matter on the surface of the water to pick up in satellite pictures. So we weren't really sure whether they were going to show up in, the, in this Landsat satellite imagery that we had access to. So we wanted to understand, one, could we even use this Landsat imagery to identify the forest in Oregon? And two, if we could, how have Oregon's bull kelp populations been changing since the 1980s, which is how far back the Landsat record goes? So as we looked into it, we found out that yes, you can actually use Landsat imagery for bull kelp. And so I wanted to show you what this actually looks like. So over here on the right is a Landsat image. Um, the dark area over on the left is ocean and the light area with you know, the hills and rivers that you can see over on the right is the land. And I've labeled that this is a picture from Southern Oregon down around Port Orford. And so if you look out in the ocean here, you see these kind of light gray smears off the coastline. Um, and that's actually the Orford Reef kelp forest which was historically the biggest kelp forest in all of Oregon. Uh, so using these images, you can actually go through, identify where the kelp is, outline it, and then quantify that area. And since these images go back to the 1980s, that gives us 35 years of new data to, to work with here. So that was really exciting. And so what did we find from these satellite records? Well, what you can see here is a time series of total bull kelp area across Oregon from 1984 to 2020. Along the bottom, we have years starting in 84. 
And over on the left over here, we have total canopy area of bulk help across the state. So that's the total area of stuff on the surface, essentially. Now, just to be clear, you kind of see we have um, each season is marked off here in a different color. And you see these strong annual cycles up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, and that's because bulk help is an annual kelp. As a, it's an annual, just like an annual in your garden. Um, it grows through the spring and summer, reproduces, and then it gets ripped out by winter waves and dies back and then comes back for a new life cycle next year. And so with, because it's an annual species, you would expect to see that kind of annual cycle. Um, so that, that cycling is ex to be expected in here. What's less expected though, is that when you run a model on this, you can actually see that since 1984, we've seen a real decline in the amount of bulk help here in Oregon across the whole state. Slowly over time, there's been a you know, continuing decrease in the amount of bulk help we have here in Oregon. We no longer get some of those really big bonanza years that you used to see back in the 1980s and 1990s. Now this is definitely worrying, uh, but in a minute I'm gonna break this down to look a little more intimately at where these losses are occurring specifically. Before I get there though, I wanna kind of talk about, we used this information to try to understand what environmental conditions set kelp up for success. So what environmental conditions were associated with good years for kelp or bad years for kelp? So we used this modeling technique of generalized linear models to correlate environmental variables like nutrients, wave height, temperatures, salinity, with cup coverage from the last 34, 35 years. And we found some really interesting things. We found some things that we expected. So for example, up here in the upper right, we found that El Nino had a strongly negative relationship with kelp cover. Uh, now El Nino, many of you may have heard of it. It's a climate oscillation that essentially goes through these three to five year cycles. And those cycles tend to predict warm or cold ocean waters. Um, so we expected there to be a negative relationship with El Nino because a lot of other kelp forest research has found this too. And it's probably related to those cycles in temperature that El Nino brings with it. So that was something we had predicted we might see and we did see it. Um, however, there were a bunch of unexpected things that we found as well too. So for example, we found that winter wave height up there in the upper left corner was actually positively related to kelp cover the following summer. So bigger waves in the winter means you'll get more kelp the next spring or summer. And that really surprised us because I, I mentioned briefly earlier that big waves actually rip kelp off the bottom of, rips up their hold fast, the thing that they're attached by, and it casts them adrift. So in other places like California, Big waves are really bad for kelp and they're negatively correlated with kelp cover. So we were really surprised to see that here, we saw the opposite. Additionally, we found that higher ocean nutrient levels were negatively correlated with kelp cover. So more nutrients in the seawater, less kelp. This again was surprising because it was the exact opposite of what has been documented pretty extensively for kelp forests in California, particularly Southern California. So I have some theories for why we see some of these unexpected drivers um, here in Oregon, and I'm happy to discuss those further in the Q&A session. Um, but for now, I'm going to move on and just kind of sum this up by saying these analyses gave us some big picture insight into what kind of environmental conditions are good or bad for bulk help in Oregon. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, Across the whole state, we are seeing loss, some loss of kelp over time. But instead of only looking at the big picture, the, the statewide picture, when you begin to dig into the data and look at how kelp populations vary by area, you see some really interesting trends. Um, and so these, these four graphs, it's the same graph that I showed you earlier. It's a time series of kelp area from 1984 to 2020 but they're just for individual reefs. So instead of being summed up across the whole state, they are for Cape Arago, um, two in Port Orford area and one down near Gold Beach. Um, and so here at the top, you can see the arrow pointing to Cape Arago. This, um, at Cape Arago, the kelp covers actually stayed pretty steady since the 1980s, just kind of ticking along, not changing all that much. 
Whereas if you look down more and towards the Port Orford area, that Rogue Reef, or sorry, not Rogue Reef, um, at Orford Reef and Redfish Rocks, these two um, graphs here in the middle, you can see that there have been some sharp declines in kelp coverage, particularly at Orford Reef. And then finally, further south at Rogue Reef, down here outside of Gold Beach, you actually only see increases in kelp coverage since the early 2000s. So things have been improving for kelp in, at Rogue Reef over the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years. So these are really variable trends. What does this mean? Well, since kelp isn't decreasing evenly across the whole state, this indicates that local conditions that can be different at each reef rather than big scale environmental conditions are influencing the health of our kelp forests locally. So these local scale drivers are important uh, or at least similarly important to big scale drivers like El Nino or overall nutrient uh, content of the water, that kind of thing. So if we're not looking at overall environmental conditions that apply across most of this area, what are these local factors that might be impacting, you know, creating these really straight or really local scale variability in kelp forest trends? Well, there could be differences in local sources of pollution or runoff. There can be local scale differences in environmental conditions like water temperature or water chemistry. However, one thing that we know is impacting some of these reefs on a local scale are urchins. So at some of these reefs, reefs, but not all of them, we're seeing really troubling numbers of urchins coming out to graze down kelp. Remember, urchins can eat a lot of kelp, so when there's too many urchins, they can graze down the kelp forest. So for example, a recent study by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife found a 10,000% increase in purple sea urchins over the past five years. Growth's study recorded 350 million purple sea urchins living near Port Orford, Oregon since 2014. So that's from an article from Jefferson Public Radio. So over here on the right, you can see some pictures that I've taken of some urchin barrens in kelp forests in Oregon. And literally, sometimes these urchins are packed in so tight that they are just spine to spine. There's no room between them. So they can be incredibly prolific and really just blanket the ocean floor and prevent any kelp from being able to establish. Now, I just want to, I want to make one note about the urchin problem. So urchins are the most obvious problem we've talked about, right? Like you can see them. You can see how many urchins there are. You can see it's a problem. But it's, it's definitely not the only stressor for kelp forest here in Oregon, um, particularly with changing environmental conditions, with climate change. If we removed all of these urchins, our kelp forest might still be declining due to pollution, climate change, or other impacts. However, I kind of think of urchins as like a pre-existing condition. Um, a kelp forest that's battered or destroyed by a million hungry urchins is going to have a much harder time adapting to climate change or dealing with pollution or something like that. So one of the things that we've identified in Oregon is if we could help get the urchin population under control, then we might kind of remove a pre-existing condition for our kelp forests and give our, our patient here, the kelp forests, a better fighting chance in the face of climate change. So some of you might be saying, wait a second, you're seeing 350 million urchins? Where did all these urchins come from? You know, why are we seeing them now? And so we don't know, to be quite honest, but we have a couple of good guesses. So first off, Oregon traditionally had two major urchin eating predators, which was the sea star, or sorry, the sea otter and the sunflower sea star. So both of these critters can both eat and scare away enough urchins that it keeps the urchin populations in check and keeps them from overgrazing the reef. However, some of you, many of y'all may be aware that sea otters were extirpated in the late 1800s by fur traders, so no more sea otters. And then around 2014, we lost sunflower sea stars to the devastating and mysterious sea star wasting epidemic that swept across the entire West Coast. A uh, recent analysis that I was involved in found declines in sunflower star populations of about 99% in this area. So while there may still be a few sunflower stars around, they are very few and very far between and probably can't play much of an ecological role anymore. So now we've lost both of our the urchin eating um, 
major urchin eating predators. There are other things that eat urchins, but not in quite enough quantities to have this kind of effect on kelp forests. So missing predators are probably playing a big part of this picture. Um, however, some of this boom in urchin populations could also be due to the changing ocean conditions that we're seeing with climate change. Really subtle changes in water temperature or currents can have massive impacts. And it's possible that recent changes to temperature or salinity or oxygen or pH or whatever may have created a favorable environment for urchins and allowed their populations to explode. So we're not exactly sure why we are seeing so many dang urchins and why we see them in some reefs and not in others, but it's likely related to a combination of, of these factors, um, missing predators and then changing ocean conditions. So let's summarize what we've learned so far about Covent Oregon. We know that kelp forests nearby in Northern California have been really struggling. They collapsed around 2015. We see some troubling signs here in Oregon, like major losses of kelp in places with lots of urgent overgrazing. Uh, what are some of the threats that are likely stressing out our kelp forests and contributing to these losses? It's likely a mixture of big picture things like changing temperatures, changing ocean conditions, and smaller scale things like urchin overpopulation or missing predators. However, I want to I want to keep in mind that there is a lot of that local scale variability and not all of our kelp forests are in trouble. Some are doing quite well. Uh, so we need to appreciate that and, and recognize that local scale variability and, and do locally targeted work around kelp forest restoration. So speaking of restoration, it's possible that I I don't want to bum anybody out. I know that we are all, you know, reading sad stories in the news about the environment and about, you know, ecosystems all the time. You know, we're hearing about all sorts of ecological disasters. And it would be easy to kind of look at this and say, oh gosh, this is another bad story. But I actually don't see it that way at all. And the reason I don't see it that way is because I actually think we have a lot of options of things that we could do to support and heal our kelp forests. So given that we are seeing kelp cover is declining across Oregon, and we're seeing some really troubling levels of urchins at some of these reefs, what are our options for preserving Oregon's kelp forests? Well, first off, I want to point to the million pound elephant in the room and say, really the biggest threat to kelp forests existentially right now is climate change. And slowing climate change will be absolutely critical to preserving Earth's kelp forests. However, I understand that you know, that is an international crisis that we don't have much control over. And so, as I mentioned before, what are some things that we can do um, at a local scale that could set kelp forests up for success? You know, give, give our patient a fighting chance in the face of climate change. Well, there's actually a lot of things we could do. We could start doing targeted urchin removals and just removing all those urchins at affected sites. We could help try to recover the sunflower star population and bring that predator back. Um, we could reintroduce sea otters and hope that they target urchin populations, so bring that predator back. That's something actually that a group called the Alaka Alliance is working on right now. Additionally, there's kelp seeding work, which is basically you raise a bunch of little bitty tiny kelps in a lab and you toss them out in the ocean. And if you toss enough of them out, it just uh, boosts the, the supply of new kelps and can um, and can quicken the pace of ecological recovery. Um, so these are some of the options, but there's actually, in the last decade, there's been a real explosion of interest around kelp forest restoration. And there are lots of other new ideas coming online about how do you best restore and recover kelp forests. And people are trying these worldwide. Um, really, I'd say that the US and Oregon in particular is actually kind of behind the times in terms of actively managing and supporting our kelp forests. So I'd be really stoked to see this kind of work start happening in Oregon. And that's why I think this isn't a bad story. I think it's, uh, or like a, a sad or catastrophic story. I think it's, I see it as an opportunity to change our habits, change our relationship to nature and take a more active role in stewarding the resources that we care about like kelp forests. Um, I do wanna take a minute to acknowledge some of the ongoing work that's that's beginning to happen here in Oregon so that y'all are aware that there is kind of a, a groundswell of interest in kelp forests. Um, 
And so we've seen, when I first came to Oregon, it felt like nobody was really talking about kelp. A lot of people didn't really know what it was or if we had kelp in Oregon. And since I, you know, in the last four or five years, I've seen all this new interest in kelp forests. So we've seen the formation of the Oregon Kelp Alliance, which is a community-based kelp forest uh, restoration organization. Um, we've seen an urchin removal experiment undertaken at Nellie's Cove. Senator Jeff Merkley just put a million dollar ask for the Oregon Kelp Alliance into a congressional spending bill that would go to support kelp forest monitoring and restoration in Oregon. Additionally, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has new money to study kelp and kelp forest related species like sunflower stars. Um, actually just announced recently, the sunflower sea star now is going to undergo ESA evaluation. So that's evaluation to be listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and if they were listed as an endangered species, that would bring all sorts of uh, money, attention, and recovery efforts to sunflower stars. I don't have it listed here, but I mentioned the Alaka Alliance is uh, pursuing trying to reintroduce otters here into Oregon. And so between all of these things going on, there's just been a lot, there's been this amazing media coverage and people asking to interview me and for me to give talks about kelp forests. And so um, that's been a really cool, a really rewarding part of my PhD is to kind of see the, the shift in attitude there's been and see that people are um, kind of coming together, kind of kind of think about, you know, we don't want to lose our kelp forest, what can we do? Um, so I would encourage you to look more into some of these efforts, learn more about them, maybe consider getting involved. And I want to take a second to just highlight um, one of these efforts in particular. Uh, so the Oregon Kelp Alliance is a recently formed group that focuses on community-based restoration of kelp forests here in Oregon. Anybody can join. We have fishers, recreational divers, chefs, tribal representatives, anybody who cares about kelp or kelp forest critters. And so last summer, the Alliance piloted an urchin removal experiment at Nellie's Cove in Port Orford. So you can see these 2017 through 2020 pictures are basically the same spot in Nellie's Cove. And you can see that even just a few years ago, there used to be a verdant kelp forest there. Um, and that's recently transformed into an urchin barren. And this kelp forest in Nellie's Cove, um, it was a kelp forest that was used pretty widely by the community for spearfishing, for tours, for recreation and snorkeling, for all sorts of different stuff. So it, it's a kelp forest that people really care about and want to keep using. And so last summer, the Oregon Kelp Alliance, using more than 30 volunteer divers, we actually cleared about 47,000 individual urchins from an area a little less than the size of a football field in Nellie's Cove. Uh, this was an experiment. So we did before and after surveys of the cove so that this coming year, we'll be able to keep track of whether our efforts removing all those urchins last year, whether that allowed for new baby kelps to settle and flourish. Um, and so it's, it's a small effort aimed at a single kelp forest, but this is the kind of thing that gives me hope, right? This is a really meaningful step in the right direction. Um, this kind of work that ORCA and, and other groups are doing is the kind of thoughtful stewardship of our kelp forest that I think is going to be critical to preserving them here in Oregon. So I was really honored to get to be a part of that work last year. Um, and I would encourage you all to check out the Oregon Kelp Alliance's website because this group is hoping to expand to sites outside of Port Orford, including um, sites that are in the central and north coast like Cape Lookout. Um, So let's see, I've been talking at y'all for about 35, 40 minutes here. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up before too long so that we have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, so as I wind down, I just kind of wanna go over some of the really high level key things that I would love for you to take away from this talk. Um, one, help for us to benefit us. They benefit coastal communities. Two, we're seeing warning signs about Oregon's kelp forests, and we need to heed those warning signs. Three, there are global and local drivers. There are things affecting these kelp forests that are kind of beyond our control, like climate change. You know, we can all play an individual role in that, but that's something that's hard for any individual one of us to stop. But also there are local scale drivers, things like 
are there predators here? Are there urchins here? Who's using this area and what are they using it for? Things like that. Is there local scale pollution? So um, the global drivers are important and we need to pay attention to those. The local drivers though, um, are places where we can take steps to make our kelp forests stronger, um, more resilient, and hopefully persist long, long into the future, even with our changing oceans. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, like I said, I wrapped up a little bit early here because I wanted to make sure we had a lot of time to talk about some of these issues, particularly since some of them are pretty pertinent to what's going on here in Oregon right now. I'm happy to talk more about otters or sunflower stars or um, things like that. Um, I just want to also note that um, I can be contacted at sahamilton at ucdavis.edu or through my Twitter account. And I love uh, getting to engage with members of the public and uh, members of coastal communities. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm based here in Corvallis, Oregon for now, working remotely at UC Davis. And I'd like to thank some of my sponsors that um, sponsored a lot of the work that you saw here today, the Nature Conservancy, Oregon State University, and the National Science Foundation. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and start, maybe ask for Jesse and, and Kent's help looking through some of these questions and sorting through them so we can get a good bunch of time to talk about them. Great. Job. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going back to the side by side gallery. Okay, cool. We can just leave this slide up if that's okay. Got Sarah's information on there. We do have a number of questions. We've got like 13 or 14 or 15 so far. So, what we're going to do, each of you gets one question. So, I'll ask one of your questions. I'm going to go back and forth. Uh, Kent is going to be helping me. I just wanted to say, Sarah, thank you. This is such a great example of the think globally, act locally, which we've been hearing for years and years and years. I loved that. It's really important when we're thinking about our kelp forests and also our rocky habitats. Um, there's a lot that we can do locally. It's really a big thing to think about climate change globally. And we're looking to our global leaders and we can we feel so helpless until we look at these local places. And um, so thank you for reminding us of that. It was wonderful. Um, I have one question before we get into everything. What is going on with Gold Beach and why is it going up? Have you looked at that yet? That was really interesting. Yeah. Cool. I have no idea. Gold Beach is not a place I've ever been able to dive out of. Um, I know urchin divers that, that dive down there, but as far as like the research and the scientific community, nobody um, really goes, you know, it's just so far away from like OSU and University of Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, so no, we don't have any idea. My guess would be something to do with urchins. There are less urchins or they're high, or the waves are the, sometimes if currents are high enough, it's really hard for urchins to stick onto the, the reef. And so maybe it's a really currenty site or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't know. There's so many, um, one of the, the things is I, about some of this work is like, I feel like I'm, people are constantly asking me good questions and it's like, I, I, I don't know. Nobody knows. Like yeah. there's so much to, uh, so much work to be done. So yeah, that's a good exactly. question. Yeah. yeah. It's like you said, it's, a, it's fairly new what's happening. So great work. Okay. We're going to get to the questions. I'm going to start with the first question that came in and then uh, Kent and I are going to be tag teaming. So I'm going to go back here. Um, and let's see, Steve asked, do we know what local factors along the central Oregon coast may be impacting the health and well-being of our bull kelp forests? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have studied the central coast a little bit less, um, and that's primarily because the bulk, there's less bull kelp up there, and the bull kelp, um, it's a bit smaller, and it tends to be really close to the shore, which means that it doesn't get picked up in the Landsat satellites as well you'd need higher resolution like drone imagery or something to be able to pick up some of these fringing beds of kelp right along the coast. So I have to say, I don't know as much about some of the central coast locations. Um, I do know that there, um, there used to be much more extensive kelp forest right outside of Depot Bay and Otter Rocks area. And that has really dwindled to almost nothing over the last 10, 20 years. So that's pretty concerning. Um, I also know that the Oregon Kelp Alliance is targeting a couple spots in, in central-ish Oregon. So I know Cape Lookout and 
um, Haystack Rock at Pacific City are two spots that we think there's a real urchin problem and we're looking into trying to do urchin removal experiments out there as well. Um, but yes, I haven't, I mean, I can point, I can kind of point to the presence of predators and, and urchins and say like, that's probably driving some of the local scale differences, but actually without going there and studying these individual kelp forests, it's pretty hard to say. So I don't think I have a super good answer to that question, unfortunately. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'll keep going with the questions and I just wanna preface that with uh, excellent presentation and I really appreciate the, the positive outlook you have as what we can do as individuals to, to help bulk uh, to help bulk help. Um, here's a question. Since there is significant discussion about trying to reintroduce sea otters in Oregon, what type of numbers would be necessary to make a real impact on bull kelp? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. I so my my first thought would be that um, the Alaka Alliance, so that's spelled E L A K H A, actually just put out a feasibility study where they kind of talked about if they were going to try to reintroduce otters, where would they introduce them? How big would the populations need to be? Some of the, some of the specifics on that question. So definitely encourage you to go check out their feasibility study if you wanna dig more into some of those questions. Um, I'm not as sure about the number of otters that would be necessary to make a significant impact, but I, I wanna point out that there's, um, otters are a little bit tricky. Okay, so it, it's definitely not a situation where it's like add otters, you know, plus otters equals happy kelp. Um, otters eat a lot of different things. They don't only eat urchins. They like to eat crabs. They like to eat clams. And so if we introduce them into, say, the Cape Arago area, they could go live out on the Cape Arago kelp forest and start munching down a bunch of urchins. Or they could go choose to live in the um, Coos Bay estu estuary up there and some of the estuaries and focus on crabs and clams and other critters. And so, A, it's kind of up to the, the otters and where they want to live. So just because we reintroduce otters does not necessarily mean they go straight for the kelp forests. And furthermore, something otters work better to prevent collapses than they do to rebuild collapses. And one of the main reasons is that urchins and urchin barrens are actually not in very good shape. They're, they're starving essentially because there's not any food around. And so they're in really bad condition. So otters don't really want to eat them. They shut, they open up a couple of urchins, see that they're empty inside and they decide to go eat crabs or clams or something like that. Um, so I, I'm not sure the numbers that we would need but we would need them to focus on, we would need them to go make their homes in kelp forests and focus their, a lot of their diet on urchins for this to have an impact. So I, I, I don't mean to say that otters won't have an impact. I just, it's more complicated than just um, add a few, you know, add salt and stir, add otters and stir kind of. Um, yeah, so, but, but we'll see. I um, have been really involved with the Olaka Alliance and, you know, personally would love to see otters back here in Oregon. So I uh, would encourage you to check them out further. Okay. Uh, you mentioned kelp seeding also as a restoration technique. Has anybody been looking into the genetic diversity and the potential for monocultures versus what diversity there is in wild kelp? Yeah, yeah, that is like the cutting edge of what's going on in the kelp forest world right now is turning um, genetic the geneticists onto the onto kelp and figuring out what lessons we can learn. And I can um, definitely assure you that there's a lot of work going on right now to try to understand where do you find the genetic diversity for kelps? So where are the, you know, the unique lines and, and types that you can find um, to try to avoid things like a monoculture? Um, so there's a lot of work going on in that right now. Um, but I'm not sure how, exactly how some of these techniques like kelp seeding and green gravel are new enough that I think it's, we're still kind of more at a proof of concept stage than we're really at a stage where we're able to like incorporate, well, let's make sure we've got the best um, genetic stock to start with, things like that. Um, but that will, will continue to be developed as the, the genetics kind of 
um, ramp up here in the next few years. So that's also a really exciting horizon. Cool. Kent, is it okay if I get this raised hand? Great. Nora has asked a question. Nora, I would love to allow you to talk. And I just did. So if you would like to unmute yourself, you can ask a question. You could have a little bit of audience participation. I've asked you to unmute. Hi, thank you so much. Actually, oh. I, that was a butt uh, raise hand, but I'm tickled to have the opportunity <laughs> to <laughs> all the same. Um, so um, with that Landsat imagery, I was wondering uh, which version of the Landsat and if there's any possibility of using other um, other um, IR imagery to get a better look. You were saying that it didn't work very well close in, but I'm just wondering if higher resolution um, satellite imagery um, other than the Landsat TM might be a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, we've got somebody who knows remote sensing here, I can tell. <laughs> um, so yeah, Landsat, we were actually able to use, um, I think Landsat 5 through Landsat 8. So we were using the TM, the ETM, and I think the OTM. There's a lot of different acronyms. So we, yeah, we just needed to use the, let's see if I get this right, the blue, red, and infrared bands mm -hmm. to do this work. And they all had those. So we were able to work, make it work across those different Landsat platforms. Um, and the second question is, yes, there is a lot of interest on both using newer satellites that have higher resolution. So things like the European Space Agency's Sentinel satellites mm -hmm. um, or commercial satellites, things like um, Planet Imagery or uh, there, there's a bunch of commercial satellites available now. Um, so using both higher resolution satellites and drones to map kelp forests. And so I'm actually part of a group that um, has kind of started working together to make a guide for managers and people who do monitoring of kelp about under what circumstance do you use satellites or drones or planes or you know kayak surveys. So it's a again that's another place that there's this explosion of interest in how do we use these different remote sensing platforms to gather information about this ecosystem that's kind of hard to study, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, you alluded to it, but uh, a lot of people in the audience might beach walk or live near uh, or go regularly. What can we do as just citizens uh, to help monitor kelp or participate in the restoration? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, I think, let me think about that for a second. There are a bunch of cool, you know, Jesse mentioned at the beginning citizen science, and there's a bunch of cool citizen science groups that are both Oregon based and, um, you know, from all over the world um, that, you know, they use observations from people who are just out in nature and they transform those into data that scientists like me use. So for what my Sunflower Sea Star project, we were using iNaturalist data, which is citizen science data. We were using reef check data from California and reef data from um, North America. And so I think more and more researchers are starting to get savvy to the idea that like, oh, like we should work with people who are beach walking because they're out there all the time, you know, taking, taking plenty of natural, you know, observations of what's going on out there. Scientists can't be everywhere at once. And so I think working with citizen science organizations um, you know, for you, that might be one like the Oregon Shores um, Coalition or um, other ones based here in Oregon and working with them to, to begin collecting citizen science um, together in like one place. Those aggregated citizen science records can um, come up with amazing amounts of data and are really starting to be, to be used in really scientifically meaningful ways. Um, so I would say citizen science organizations like that. And then, um, yeah, some of the you know, I think a good thing to do might be to get on the Oregon Kelp Alliance listserv. They have an email list and you could just stay up to date about what activities are going on in your area or, um, you know, when we're having a culling event, if you wanted to come down and see some of the urchin culling. Um, so I think, yeah, those are probably my, my, off the top of my head, my best thoughts.
Kent, do you got the next one or should we can go ahead, Jesse? Raised hand. Okay. I think we'll do another raised hand. Dennis, you can unmute yourself. Okay, I think I just did. Can you hear me? You can. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm focused on the mid coast, and you mentioned a little bit about um, Depot Bay and uh, Cape Outlook. Um, so I'm wondering if you have a status report on the changes to the kelp beds in that area. I have personally observed a decline in, say, August, September. Uh, visual uh, sightings of um, of the kelp, which lies along the surface, mm -hmm. going from you know maybe a quarter of a mile um, stretch around you know south of Depot Bay to nothing. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you have any information about anything from mm -hmm. from Otter Rock to Cape Fowlweather up to Depot yeah. uh, in terms yeah. of its status and changes. Yeah, I do have a lot of that information. Um, a couple thoughts off the top. Um, the one that I know, uh, the one area that I know well, or the one area that I know the kelp well there is the Depot Bay Otter Rock area. And I um, had mentioned that that reef actually has had really, has pretty much dwindled away to like a, almost no kelp anymore. Um, that started around 2000. So over the last 20 years, that's really dwindled away. Um, so that's Depot Bay Otter Rock area. As far as some of the other areas, you know, like Cape Lookout and, and other places like that, if you wanted more specific information, I would recommend you email me because uh, I have it. I can run those numbers. I just uh, don't have it off the top of my head. Um, and then the you mentioned you had noticed a really intense decline from August to de December. And that's probably related to the annual cycle of bull kelp. So this is the time of year when big winter storms start, you know, the waves get really big and they start ripping a lot of kelp out. And you'll, so from summer to winter, you'll see a lot less kelp on the surface and you'll start to see a bunch of it washed up on shore. And so that's from winter storms ripping it out. So that could well be that, um, that kind of annual phenomenon. Yeah, no, actually I was referring to the annual difference at the same, during the same month um, from prior years when I saw very big stretches of, of uh, kelp on the surface, but the last couple of years, almost nothing. So it's, it's really more a year to year thing. Yeah, yeah, if you email me, I um, have some, I will definitely have some data from that area that I could work up pretty easily for you to show you kind of specific trends in that region. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Dennis. Sarah, you uh, picked my interest, and I see it in a lot of the questions here. What's up with the big waves and the negative relationship to kelp area in the following Good. Summer? I'm glad people asked. I think this is so cool. So we don't know. But our best guess right now, the one that makes the most sense, is that so we think, so I, I mentioned earlier that urchins don't do well in really high current or high wave areas because their little feet can't hold on to the bottom. You know, if they're high enough waves, it rips them off and tosses them out into the ocean. Um, and so what, I, what we kind of think is happening is that in the winter, when there are really bad waves, the urchins are either knocked off the reef or they like, there's been studies that show that they like, crouch down into cracks and crevices and hide themselves away so it's so they won't get ripped off the um, ripped off the rocks. Mm -hmm. And if they're crouched down in crevices, they're not out on the reef looking for little tiny baby kelp to start mowing down because winter is when probably those little kelps are really tiny and just beginning to settle and trying to start growing. So if in big wave conditions, the urchins aren't out and about uh, grazing down those juvenile kelp. Um, so we think it would be called a, a um, indirect indirect effect, essentially, that the waves have on kelp through um, changing urchin behavior, essentially. So that's my best guess. We could do, there's a really cool experiment that could be done to, to show whether that's true or not, if I had, you know, the funding to do it. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what I think is going on there. Cool. I hope you get the funding. That'd be great. <laughs> um, it's a super interesting question here. Um, 
a couple of ones that I really wanted to get to. Uh, one is from Marley's and she says she sees large clumps of intertwined bull kelp and sometimes there's rope in the mix. What are the threats to tearing out large clumps of bull kelp from our ocean from, from ropes? Well, I have never thought about that before and I've never been asked that question before. And it's totally a problem with um, whales and whale entanglement. So mm -hmm. that's a really interesting question because yeah, you can you see sometimes the bull kelp get wrapped around each other and when that happens, um, essentially there's more drag on the, on the kelp itself and the waves um, impact it more. And so they're more likely to get ripped out when they're wrapped around each other like that. So if rope was like kind of encouraging that, um, but yeah, that's really cool. I'd never thought about that before. Um, so now I have something um, kind of related to plastic and plastic pollution to, to think about in terms, in regards to kelp forests. So yeah, that's, that's a new one. That's a great thought. Thanks for sharing that. Good question, Marlies. And then I wanted to grab one more before we went back to Kent um, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, should we say anything about leaving red urchins and others and focusing on purple urchins being the culprits? That's from Kathleen. Yeah, that's an astute question. Yeah, for folks who don't know, there's two main species of urchins here in Oregon, purple urchins and red urchins. Um, I would say the, the real increase in numbers that we've seen recently are the purple urchins, not the reds. And in Northern California, it was the purple urchins that um, really had this huge population boom and overgrazed the kelp. So I would say it's much more likely that, ur that the purple urchins are, are really our problem. Um, and so actually in that culling experiment we did this summer, we only culled purple urchins. We were not allowed to cull red urchins, so we would leave them alone. Um, so yeah, I think, I, think, I think the purples are probably the, the main issue over the last few years. Um, I don't think it's reds as much. Well, questions are coming in faster than we have time left, but a uh, question from Jacqueline, what's done with the urchins that are cold and are there, uh, are people exploring options for their use? Yeah, there's not much being done right now. Um, right now we cull them underwater. Uh, we just not crack them open with uh, hammers which sounds a little uncouth, but it works. Um, they could be used, the, the tests themselves make excellent addition to gardens because they're really calcium uh, rich. And so they could be used as fertilizer. Um, also another thing that is being kind of tested out right now is something called urchin ranching, which I think is adorable because it makes me think of an urchin with like a cowboy hat and a little lasso, like he's ranching, but anyways which is the idea that you remove urchins from reefs and you bring them back to shore and you fatten them up on at like an aquaculture farm essentially, and then you sell them for a profit. Um, so that's something else that um, there's actually one or two people doing in Southern Oregon and trying to see if that would work as like a business model. Um, yeah, and then if you don't actually kill the urchins, if you just remove them, um, you can, urchins are sold, there's a real commercial interest in urchins uh, to be used for their gonads, for their uni, which is used in high-end sushi. Um, so they can be sold that way, but they have to be in good condition. So remember I was saying that urchins and barons are usually starved. So those ones aren't the ones that end up, you know, their uni does not end up on the fancy sushi um, restaurant table. It's only the urchins that are in good condition. So um, I don't know of anybody that's currently looking into using urchin uh, tests for fertilizer or anything like that. So I would say that's kind of an undeveloped area. And if you had any interest or something like that, you might um, get in touch with me or the Oregon Kelp Alliance. And also the otters don't eat the urchins that don't have the gonads or if they're, if they're, right? Yeah. Those are not, yeah. those the are otters, like, another the question in there too. Okay. Yeah, they're like, they're like, they're ritzy, you know, sushi goers. They like their good uni. They don't like their skinny, pale uni. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we are at um, an hour and four minutes. Um, Kent, do you want to do one more question before we close out the evening? And I wanted to just say anyone who didn't have their questions answered, feel free to email Sarah right here at Sarah Hamilton. Uh, S.A. Hamilton at ucdavis.edu. So Kent, did you want to take the last question of the evening? Sure, maybe one more question. So many good ones here. Um, I know. <laughs> pollution, pollution types and sources, what is most harmful to bull kelps? Oh, pollution types, yeah. 
Um, so most of the cases, in most of the cases I've seen, the pollution um, has been any, so because kelps photosynthesize, they need good clear light. So any pollution that clouds the, clouds the water column, whether that's um, nutrient runoff that causes phytoplankton blooms or clouds up the water, um, or that could be, um, I'm thinking about sedimentation, you know, when dredging happens or the logging industry, there's a lot of, um, when they float logs down um, through river channels and things like that, there's a lot of pieces of uh, decaying logs that come off. And so that clouds up the water column. So it's less about things that are toxic. Kelps don't care that much about toxins, but they do care a lot about anything that makes the water cloudy. Um, so those are the kinds of pollution that tend to give kelp problems. How about one more question, Ken? Why don't you choose? <laughs> oh gosh, so many. Uh, there are so many. <laughs> <laughs> Or Sarah, if you see some, if you see one or two, you can also go ahead. I didn't even think about that. We just wanted to make sure that we were managing a large crowd, but if you would there like to one. take a couple, please do. <laughs> there was one I wanted to, to point to. Someone asked about harvesting bull kelp. And so I just wanna give people a quick um, overview. Um, there is harvesting for bull kelp. However, it is not legal in Oregon to harvest bull kelp for com commercial purposes. Um, but it is done in Alaska, British Columbia, and Northern California. Um, although maybe, maybe not California anymore with their collapse, but um, it can be harvested. It can be eaten. You can look up bull kelp uh, pickle recipes and make your own bull kelp pickles. And um, if you see fresh kelp that has a uh, bull kelp that's washed up on the beach, if it like, you know, if it doesn't look like it's been eaten away or decayed at all, if it looks kind of fresh, it smells nice and, and CBD. Um, you can, that, um, that stuff has already been dislodged from the bottom. So it's not, um, it's, a, it's not harvesting it technically. So if you wanted to take some of that, if you come across some of that on the beach and you want to make full kelp pickles, uh, there are recipes online for that. So you could do some of some, um, beach walk harvesting yourself. Cool. Oh my gosh. Wow. That was a lot of questions. That's amazing. <laughs> Do you want to take one more before we say goodbye? No, it's okay. Anybody who has really okay. anything burning, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, but yeah, that I'm just more, uh, thank you all so much for uh, this platform, this opportunity to chat with y'all and with this amazing engagement. We've had so many people stay all the way to the end. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> Thanks for sticking with us. <laughs> <laughs>